with all levels of persons in the educational field to participate in seminars in which parents are involved, in which teachers on the elementary and secondary school levels are involved, college professors, school boards, and also to spend sometimes two weeks or three weeks on a college campus and observe many, many things and participate in the activities on state campus. Thus, I speak to you today, not from the standpoint of ne necessarily an academician limited by the parameters of being located in one particular situation, but I'd like to speak to you on the basis of having had the opportunity to be involved in many kinds of different educational situations, and thus hopefully will be able to provoke your thinking, if you don't necessarily agree with me, but at least to provoke your thinking on the future of higher education as I surely take and view it. Thank you for this opportunity this afternoon. The consensus today among educators and other authorities is that demographics, a reduced rate of economic growth, and increased private sector cooperation, and rising fiscal demand from other social services will definitely have an impact on higher education delivery systems in America for the remainder of this century. And key issues will include the impact of enrollment trends in this sector, the role and the mission of higher education institutions, student aid, and the role of the federal government. Three in five of all American high school graduates now enroll in college. Indeed, the United States has outdistanced all other industrialized nations in the proportion of its young people who do participate in higher education. And equally important is the diversity of the 12 million post-secondary students. More than half of all undergraduates are women. One out of every six right now is a member of a minority group. Two out of every five are over the age of 25. What a change that is. Two out of every five. Fewer than three in five are attending college full time. Rather than serving a select few, American undergraduate education is truly serving the masses. And the college degree has become the basic credential for an ever-growing number of occupations, as well as a necessary criterion for leadership in virtually all walks of life. As American society demanded a more highly educated labor force, higher education became not merely a preserver and a transmitter of culture, but an integral part of our economic progress and our national well-being. Now, planning for a decline in the number of students in the primary service group, 18 to 24 year old, will be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, challenge to future higher educational administrators and policy makers. Because current population projections indicate that this traditional college age population will decrease beginning in the 1980s, and we are beginning to see signs of it. Therefore, the higher education community will be confronted with the challenge of determining the appropriate responses at an institutional, state, and federal level. Enrollment patterns have already changed. One in three college freshmen have delivered, have delayed entry into college after high school. I've gotten all these figures recently from the Department of Education, the American Council of Education. I did a lot of homework in order to try to be up to date. More than two in five undergraduates now attend college part-time. 
and over half of the bachelor's degree recipients take more than the traditional four years to complete the college degree. And usually, enrollment trends in higher education have followed the trend of the 18 to 24-year-old age population. However, the 1980s are, have indicated and continue to indicate that this may be as different as higher education institutions now begin to realize that they must attempt to attract older students. Many colleges and universities in this country have now become cognizant of the fact that if they do not realize that change is in the nature of things because of what's happening socially, economically, politically in our society, that they stand a chance of seeing a steady diminution of the numbers of traditional higher education students, usually those in the 18 to 24 year old age category, not being enough to keep college doors open. The census report, the last census report, suggests that higher education enrollment of students over 35 years old are definitely on the upswing. Enrollment rates also are rising in another group of Americans beyond that traditional college age. And that group, of those persons between the ages of 25 and 34. For the past several years, the proportion of these two age groups enrolled in some kind of post-secondary institution has continued to increase to the point that more than one-third of all college students today in America are 25 years of age or older, more than one-third. Who would ever have dressed just even 12 years ago that we would see the change or the swing in the direction of those groups of persons in our society who have not been a part of the traditional college age level students that we usually think of, and those are the individuals between the ages of 18 and 24. Now, the rising enrollment of older students may not sufficiently offset the projected losses of younger students, since older students will be more likely to enroll part-time. And in addition, these students often have very different goals and different needs. We're, not, we're going to have to be looking at curriculum. We're going to have to be looking at priorities. The continuing education of mid-career adults may become very well a third tier in addition to undergraduate and professional or graduate work among the basic post-secondary enrollment groups. And these changes now indicate a shift in the traditional patterns for higher education enrollment trends as we have known them for approximately the past 50 years in America. The important question here, of course, is what impact Will these changes have on the institutions themselves? Will they close their eyes and stick their necks into bits of sand like ostriches? Or will they accept the new challenges that now confront those of us who are a part of each academia? But before addressing this concern, it's important to look at a never enrollment trend and a trend that is causing quite a bit of concern. And that trend is the shift from the liberal arts undergraduate education to the specialized bachelor's degree. Increasing numbers of undergraduates are majoring in narrow specialties. American colleges, community colleges, and universities now offer more than 1,100 different majors and programs, nearly half of them in the occupational field. And the proportion of bachelor's degrees awarded in arts and sciences, as opposed to professional and vocational programs, fell from 49% in 1971 to 36% in 1982. And the percentages of arts and sciences awarded by community colleges 
the degree that is most likely to lead to a transfer to a four-year institution declined from 57% in 1970 to 37% in 1981 with a corresponding rise in occupational degrees. Students have abandoned some of the traditional arts and science fields in large numbers. Just since 1977, the proportion of entering freshmen intending to major in the physical sciences has declined by 13%. And this next one troubles me deeply. In the humanities, by 17%. In the social sciences, by 19%, and in the biological sciences, by fully 21%. Now, not only do these statistics raise serious questions about whether graduate students will have any underclassmen to enable them to have teaching assistantships, but one wonders whether anyone will be able to maintain literature or biology department if there's no one interested in these subjects. And furthermore, to take this a step further, if no students are majoring in these areas, who will teach the facets or sociology in the next generation? And my concern in the humanities stems from the fact that we realize people want to be able to leave the world of college and go out into the world of work and that there is a need to prepare yourself academically, business-wise, technically, or what have you, so that you can become a productive citizen in America. But what troubles me, along with the development, of course, of the fact that we are living in a computerized age, is what is going to really happen with respect to thinking, with respect to the question of inquiry. The humanities have always been very important in bringing together multifaceted, variegated students and people in a way that helps us to develop along the line that there is a commonality existing in America with respect to American thought, American politics, American attitudes, based on many of the different subjects that are taught usually in the humanities department. It is also a question of students leaving college and being able to think logically and rationally and being able to hold the kinds of conversations and engage in, in an inquiry that gives them the knowledge which in turn leads them to become poised and self-confident as they go out into this world of conflicting values and complexity. I've become so deeply concerned that so many students that I meet who graduate from college may write very, very well and are bright and fairly intelligent. But in terms of conversations with them on certain subject matters, there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, and a lack of basic information that can only come to them if colleges proceed to recognize that the arts and the humanities are a body of knowledge that are very important. And a well-rounded person, a well-educated person, is a person who is not only at home with himself in terms of the discipline that he has accepted in order to be productive, but he's also able to be at home in terms of the environment and the world about him. And that is a well-rounded person, a well-rounded, educated person, is not a person that just takes the requirement for a degree and then comes out half-baked. He's often like the emperor in his new clothes. Now, of course, we recognize <clears throat> that the thrust, this thrust towards specialization is clearly linked to one basic thing, in my opinion, as I talk with hundreds of students around this country, and that is the student anxiety about the job market. Specialized degree programs, however, in my opinion, do have some strong 
academic drawbacks. While specialization may be a virtue for some students, as more narrow programs are created, they tend to become isolated from each other. And many students end up with fragmented and limited knowledge. And while depth of study in any area has great, great value, the guidelines established by many professional accrediting bodies distort students' expectations and close off their future options. The result is that the curriculum of many colleges has become just a little bit too excessively vocational in their orientation. And the bachelor's degree has lost its potential to foster the shared values and knowledge that bind us together as a society. Institutions, of course, all institutions, of course, are going to be seriously affected by both of these kinds of enrollment trends. Colleges and universities face different futures, in many instances, depending upon their regional location. Population declines have been projected for some re regions, no growth for other regions, and population increases for yet other areas in this country. For higher education, the future includes a pattern of regional differences as well as different futures for different types of institutions. Among the public institutions, the large public universities and the public community colleges may not be adversely affected because analysis of the census data suggests that the land-grant universities will prosper. And the land-grant universities will prosper because of their programs, their images, and their financial bases. In the Midwest, however, it must also be said that many of these schools may survive, maybe because no one wants to see the Big Ten football go down the tube. After all, if Ohio State or Michigan State weren't around, who would the Pac-10 schools play in the Rose Bowl? Community colleges are predicted to maintain their position because they can attract larger numbers of students who cannot afford residential institutions students who seek technical or paraprofessional training, or students who are not yet ready to make the commitment implied by attending a four-year college. Community colleges may have proportionately fewer traditional undergraduates, that is, in the 24 group, but expanded enrollment from the older age groups may protect these colleges from being as seriously affected by the decline as many of your four-year institutions. Now, regional state universities are presenting a different kind of problem. Your regional state universities, many of them, may be faced with decline because their location in more rural areas will not provide them with access to an adult population seeking post-secondary opportunities. And many of these institutions, many of them, not all of them, many of them, do not have programs of recognized quality nor the same financial base as the larger land-grant public universities. Schools like Ashuni, my own state of New York, Schools like a SUNY at New Paltz, New York, or for example, a school that I've been at for a while at the University of California in Riverside, may soon have to face the hard decision of closing their doors. 
because of a combination of demographics and so many other things that have entered into their particular pictures. Now concerning the future of private institutions, so much has been written and said about their continuing role in higher education. Some observers contend that most of the highly selective, well-established private colleges, like those in the Ivy League or Stanford in California, they will have little trouble maintaining enrollment because of their image, their prestige, and their capacity to expand the market from which they draw their students. Many small church-related four-year colleges are expected to maintain their financial support base and their student bodies. But both the historically black private colleges and the less well-established private schools are going to continue to expect to encounter all kinds of problems. This university is an example of potential problems facing these schools. These latter two types of institutions, the nation's black colleges and the smaller private schools, they will continue to suffer. And they will suffer because of the double effect of a lack of growth in federal funds because most of them depend on the grants, the bar grants and the star grants and the different kinds of grants that have been a part of the entire federal role in education. And added to this is the competition for students all over the country. And then last but not least is the reduced availability of private funds and a very small alumni base. Your large institutions like Yale and Dartmouth and Mount Holyoke, on whose staff I am, located right now, these kinds of institutions have very, are very well endowed. So that during, during any kind of crisis, it is not even necessary to call on the principal in these endowments. They can use the interest and the dividends to tide them over. But your smaller schools and your black colleges have never been able to have the kind of endowment that would be able to sustain them during very trying economic times in our nation. Now the problem of institutional survival is even more severe because of the location of the nation's private colleges. And I'm finding out as I begin to look at my graph and chart these things, that most of these nation's private colleges, they're found in a northeast and midwest belt running from Maine to Iowa and Missouri. And this band of states in this belt, together with Washington, D.C., accounts for about only 30, real, 30 percent of the nation's public college students. But the private institutions in these states that I just talked about enroll over 60 percent of our private college students in this country. The continued emphasis on proposals to reduce or at least limit the level of federal grants and loans may be taking a toll in terms of the capacity of these private institutions to maintain a mixed student body. You're already seeing all across this land the diminution of black students, Hispanic students, Chicano students, Native American students, on many, many college campuses for a host of reasons. And recent reports suggest that the prestigious private institutions are receiving a smaller percent of applications from potential students 
who did not attend college. And the contention is, we may or may not agree with the contention, but the contention is that the student applicants are convinced that they cannot afford the prestige institution. Some observers contend that this development is an indicator that students are beginning to downgrade their choices in the selection of a higher education institution. Of course, there are many people who still think that only the sons and the most recently the daughters of Harvard graduates should be admitted to that illustrious Cambridge institution. Well, of course, if this trend continues, we are going to be seeing a cementing of elite colleges and universities only for the elite. Needless to say, this would be most unfortunate given just the last 10 years before we found ourselves on this retrogression in the educational arena on the national level. Given this kind of situation, we will be seeing the diverse and equally diverse economic and social groups in this society not being found at all in the nation's private colleges and universities. And one of the great determinants about the future of diversity in higher education, of course, is this whole question of student financial assistance. The extension of college opportunities to virtually all interested students in the United States can be traced to such developments as the creation of our land-grant colleges, to the development of our state universities, to the enactment of the famous GI Bill, to the rapid expansion of the community college systems and the enactment of the Higher Education Act that provided most of the current programs of student grants and loans. The concept of universal access has taken on, my friends, a particular kind of urgency. Access and equity. Two of the things that the educational arena is going to have to be faced with. One says you can't have access without equity, you can't have equity with access. Well, no matter what the dialogue is or what side of the argument or the debate you are on, I think we must never, never forget that it wasn't until the advent of the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration in the 60s that the federal government decided that it had to play a very important role in education in this country. And it was out of that particular administration that we saw the beginning of access in this country. We saw the beginning of large numbers of blacks and Hispanics and Native Americans being able to go to college. We saw the students in Appalachia being able to go into their rural colleges and community colleges. We saw the importance of the recognition that students could not be prepared for this society which was constantly changing and moving into the technological computerized age in which we are living unless they were prepared, unless they had the requisite skills to compete in a diversified society. And so we saw the beginning of the bar grant. Over 60% of the American students today could not be in college if it were not for something called the bar grants, the work study programs, the child grants, all of the different kinds of mechanisms that Lyndon Baines Johnson, over much adversity and many attacks, was able to say must become a part of a federal policy in terms of education in the United States of America. And now we see that there is definitely an erosion of that overall commitment on the part of the federal government. For example, and I'll be finished soon because I want to give you the opportunity to ask me questions. But for example, <clears throat> there's
the Title IV student aid program and the Higher Education Act are intending, were intended to provide lower income students with federal grants and other non-loan support to help meet some of the educational costs. For middle income students and those lower income students who still need additional financial help, the Guaranteed Student Loan, the GSL program, evolved over the many, many years as the primary source of federal loan aid. And it has come to be viewed as another mainstay of access. And in addition, these programs are designed for students' choice as well as access to a higher education institution. And the use of this Title IV student aid is considered critically important to higher cost colleges. Because without it, students might well decide that the significant cost differences between the average public university and the average private university, which is estimated to be about five or $6,000, places the private university education out of reach. We want to be able to continue in this country, which is supposed to be a multifaceted, variegated society, the opportunity not only for access, but also what is equally important is the right to have choices. And we are very deeply concerned about what is happening in the direction for the future as to whether our students are even going to be able to make choices. We wonder about whether you have to take what's there or forget about it. In a democracy, we have to watch that kind of trend. Currently, some policy analysts suggest that the intense interest in increasing access to student aid appears to have declined. The fiscal mood and circumstances of the early 80s, of course, we all know so well, spelled austerity, at least in the short run. And at the federal level, declining revenue growth and increasing deficit exert more and more pressure on the domestic budget. Believe me, after six years of budget reductions by the current administration, actually there's very little left in the domestic programs except for large programs like Social Security, Medicare, and student financial assistance. And many observers continue to fear that appropriations for education will lag behind inflation for the next several years. And as a result, you know what's going to happen? It's happening right now. Tuition increases have to, in, have to take place, and they are continuing to occur. Because when we started out with the bar grant and student aid programs, and students can get three, four thousand dollars a year, whatever the case may be. We realize today that with just a slight increase, we're really off about three thousand dollars at least. And even optimists believe that level funding, which really is a loss in real terms, is only the best thing that we can hope for in the immediate future. What then with this resource that shares with you? What will all of these things mean? What will all these trends mean in terms of the federal government's role in higher education? Pressure to reform the student aid program must continue, in my opinion, to be at the top of the list.
does the current system have sufficient checkpoints to ensure that students maintain satisfactory progress in their academic programs and ultimately complete their degree? What kind of paperwork burden will this place on institutions? Will each school have the freedom to determine what constitutes satisfactory progress? These are rhetorical questions I'm raising because I tell you they're coming up in the near future. Should the entire student aid program be modified to provide for recognition of achievement or ability as well as financial needs? In other words, a merit test for financial aid, just as male students now have a draft test in order to receive financial aid? And thirdly, should current student aid programs be completely recast or new ones devised in response to the nation's specific manpower problem? Manpower planning has been unsuccessful in systems which are more centralized than our own system. That because there seems to be no guarantee that such a strategy would work any better in the United States for a host of reasons which will take another speech. And other issues that we have to look for include the expansion of university-based research programs, the reduction in funding for special emphasis programs, like the TRIO program to serve the disadvantaged, and some modifications in Title III, which largely goes to the support of historically black colleges, and Title VII the construction, reconstruction, and renovation of academic facilities right now in Washington, D.C. There are a number of us working on all of these issues, doing a lot of research and sending out questionnaires and visiting different places so that we don't make any changes or we don't profess to move in the direction of making changes or recommending national legislation unless we have the facts at hand. One of the suggestions that I've made to many of my peers is that the time has come when those in Washington who have the responsibility to come up with the legislation and the laws and the rules and the regulations that have an impact on our lives, that we must leave the United States Capitol and go out into the villages and the towns and the cities and the rural areas and talk with the people and talk with the educators in this, these areas and spend time with them and find out before we begin to reevaluate, rewrite, reconstruct, re-anything that we have heard from the people and we know what we need to do. There are too many of us in Washington, D.C. who have the tendency just to call the masses into Washington, D.C. as we sit on the rostrum and have public hearings, and we don't have any idea, particularly in the educational field, I've watched it for 15 years, any idea about the combination of factors that must be taken into consideration if we are interested in continuing to educate for a democracy the majority of the people who must continue to guide and protect this country. Finally, the future of higher education will largely be dependent upon maintaining access and choice, in my humble opinion, for students, all students, regardless of their economic background. 
efforts to limit the student financial assistance program or the special emphasis program in the Higher Education Act must continue to be vigorously opposed if we are to save higher education as we now, at this moment, in this order of time, know it. Ind institutions themselves must also make some kind of commitment, some kind of commitment to broadening undergraduate education so that it retains its liberal arts underpinning. But of course, institutions cannot be expected to survive without help. There is a dilemma, of course, a dilemma as to what criteria will be used in selecting the institutions or programs to receive assistance and the amount and the duration of this assistance. Those of us who care deeply about the future of higher education in this country must push for change in order to preserve our colleges, in order to make sure never again in this nation should we have segments not having the opportunity for access and choice of institutions and to ensure that the future becomes brighter for higher ed. Oh yes, the hour is growing late in America. Let us then therefore, if we have a commitment, concern, compassion, let us then try to create and recreate if necessary a dynamic, diversified kind of future for America's higher education. I thank you. I would just like to make a very brief preliminary statement. I don't profess to know everything. If I don't know the answer to your question, I'm not afraid to say I don't know. And that's the challenge for me then to go and look it up. I won't be like some politicians. And I was a politician for 25 years, so I'm not knocking it. And also, please try to refrain from making lengthy statements. You can make a brief statement if you desire, but by making lengthy statements, you prevent other persons from getting an opportunity to properly ask their questions. That's all. Okay. Did you mind? Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to make a brief statement that having been here since the beginning of the conference, I have a pretty good idea about what, about the title of the proposal, the American Dream. Um, I wanted to go from that and talk about one of the trends you discussed in terms of uh, higher education undergraduates going towards uh, majors that are engineering, uh, the sciences, any kind of productive type major. Um, one of the things that many of the speakers have done is they've divorced um, a student's career choice from a capitalistic society. We are not rewarded for our Socratic thought. We're not rewarded for our um, whether we can, can talk about the great works, we are rewarded for whether we can perform on the job, get the, get the uh, plans out, whether we can design something. And I'd like to have you address that situation because for the American, uh, for the uh, college undergraduate, that's a very difficult position to be in. And it's one where I think the issue, the issue of undergraduate education Center. I know exactly what you're saying, and that is why I mentioned I'm very deeply concerned about a kind of low prioritization now with respect to philosophy and the humanities and the arts and all of those great disciplines 
that really makes an individual a truly educated individual and an individual conversant with the times in which he or she lives and is able to expand the mind at our rising. I'm going to say something that if, you, if people want to boo me, you can. I'm used to everything. I had the opportunity to work with a group of English undergraduate students from the University of Oxford in England, the University of Heidelberg in Germany, for six weeks. I came back to America, and that was about, oh, I guess about eight years ago. And I came back to America angry, upset. And the reason I was angry and I was upset was I was truly taken back by the depth of the knowledge of these young people, the philosophy, the great books, the great orators, even being able to quote them, educated young people. And not only that, what further was disturbing to me, well, of course, I would expect it in England, but not so much in Germany, that these young people spoke the English language, and particularly in Germany, where it's the second language, so eloquently, so beautifully, can express themselves. When we talk about syntaxes and all of the different things, they know they knew so much more than the college students that I met here in America. I got angry. I got mad, and I shared this information with a number of people in the educational professional field, and all they can give you is excuses as to why it happened and why they think it happened. And I really truly believe that what we have to do, we have to somehow reassess what is a good college education. What should it embrace? When these students walk out with their bachelors, what should they be prepared to do, not only in terms of their disciplines or if they're going on to professional schools, we understand that, but how well read are they? Uh, we, we, don't, we don't pay attention to those items anymore because of a combination of several factors that are happening. Years ago, it was predicted that this society was going to be evolving into a very highly technological, computerized society. And we didn't begin to prepare our curriculums and look at it until somebody was shot in space. Then we saw the interest in math and science and what have you. We're always reacting. There are signals constantly in a society that indicates that we must be about the business of preparation so that we don't react and we get so confused because we react so often impulsively. And this is what is happening to us in a number of things, that we can begin to lay the groundwork and we can begin to prepare. I happen to believe, and after having been out here all these years, I happen to believe that the time has come in America when we must stop applying band-aids to festering educational stories. I think we need to really be able to take about 1,000 educational administrators and teachers and school board members in their field and take them to some place for about a month. No telephones, no shopping flashes, no nothing. And sit down uninterruptedly and talk with each other and come in with an agenda. All of us will get homework before we go to wherever that retreat is going to be. And out of this, be able to get some kind of consensus as to some of the changes and the direction that we now must begin to move education in our country. If not, we're going to continue to operate the way we do. I am deeply, deeply concerned, and maybe too much so. I'm not saying I am right but I'm deeply concerned about the inadequate humanities courses that I am seeing in universities and colleges as some back to a few years ago. I'm deeply concerned that students, I go to debating 
societies and listen to them debate. And uh, the, the, the thinking is not always logical. They have bits of information, but they haven't learned the significance of logical inquiry. Why I'm deeply concerned about all of those things. But of course, some student told me recently, you have to be concerned about all of those things because you've always said over and over, mediocrity is not the answer. The world is filled with mediocre individuals. Excellence reaps reward. I'm concerned about excellence. I was the coordinator of the U.S. campaign on, oh. the, on the New York State issue. Oh, thank and you. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, when are you going to do it again, and why not this year? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said recently, watch Shirley Chisholm. She's been running around this country just because she's interested in education. Because I came in from Vermont, I was in Vermont a couple of days, then I went into Philadelphia. I'm here tonight, I'm leaving for Atlanta this evening. But I tell you this very honestly, my thing is education, you know, education and women and blacks. I, if I, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, I fully believe that if I were a white woman, the last presidential election that I would have been selected and placed on the ticket. But there are four or five reasons. My high visibility raised itself into public view. Secondly, I'm not here to boast to any of you. I had 22 years of experience in the political arena, state legislator, congresswoman, speech writer for 10 years for Democrat and Republican a person who was used by black politicians and white politicians in Hispanic communities because I was the only person around that could go into Hispanic communities and speak in English and then speak in Spanish and speak about my versatility. But nobody wanted to suggest that I was put on the ticket because I was black. I, I, I don't care what anybody thinks. Can you imagine a black woman or Hispanic woman for that matter with only six years of experience experience from the Congress being put on a ticket for vice president. Ms. Ferrara had only six years in politics, no background or anything else, and yet she was put on the ticket. She was white. Many, many of the legislators in the Congress said Shirley Chisholm should have been put on the ticket. But I also know one other thing. I also know one other thing, and I make no bones about it. It would be most difficult for a white male to put a woman of the ilk of Shirley Chisholm on their ticket because Shirley Chisholm is independent-minded. And Shirley Chisholm doesn't play the ball. She doesn't play the game in the right way. So I, I didn't kid myself. I didn't kid myself about not being placed on the ticket. People thought I should be more angry. No, I'm not being more angry. I'm pragmatic, and I understand what made me angry was that they didn't call in someone like a Patricia Harris. Patricia Harris, who was the ambassador to Luxembourg, a beautiful black woman, the head of HUD, the head of HEW, vice chairman of the Democratic National Committee. They didn't call in her someone, they called in a Geraldine Ferrara. She was white, and that's all there is to it. They combined racism and sexism in the bloodstream of America. Has not yet gotten this country to the point where people can look at you and say, Never mind the amount of melanin in your skin. If you've got it, we'll back you. I don't intend. I don't intend to subject myself again to that kind of thing. I did it because I'm a Catholic for change. I dare to do things that other people don't do. They may talk about it but they don't have the courage, the guts, the audacity, the confidence, the self, the faith in God to say, these are trends that you must think about. I dare to do those things. I'm going to be a catalyst until the day I die. I have no personal ambitions, believe you me when I tell you, to run for office again. 
my own personal agenda does not include politics. But I'm not saying if they draft me, I wouldn't consider. We have time for two more questions. At the end of the second question, um, there's a special presentation to Ms. Chisholm from the Delta Sigma Theta sorority at the IUP chapter. After that, at 2.30, there's a reception in the museum in John Sutton Hall that you all are welcome to attend. I know. Um, yeah. Before closing, too, there will be other remarks by the chairperson, Harvey Holt. I noted, uh, Howard, that there's three persons, so could we take the three persons on the line? One, two, three. All right. That gentleman, then that gentleman, then the honors will go to you. Yes. Uh, my question is whether or not there is a future for black colleges and universities. If we look at the history of black colleges and universities, we find that they were established because of the rampant racism and discrimination in American society. And of course, as that racism and discrimination has declined to some degree, we find that increasingly more black students are going to black schools. We find also that some of our best minds, particularly black faculty, black professors in various disciplines, also are moving to the larger, more prestigious black schools. And I'm wondering whether there is a more fundamental problem here, which does not simply rely upon federal money, although I think that's very crucial, but in terms of as desegregation increases in the society, uh, as we move towards, quote, a more pluralistic society, more diversity, mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether black colleges and universities will be able to withstand uh, that kind of movement. All right, you asked a very, very important question, a very important issue. Boy, there's so much to say about that, but let me try to, to leave four basic points with you if I see it. Number one, I have visited over half the black colleges in this country during the past six years. And I can tell you that close to 50 or 55 percent of the students in those colleges would never go to college if they did not have the black institutions to give the particular kind of individualized attention so that they don't get lost in the multitude. Because of a combination of socioeconomic factors in the backgrounds of these students, many of them could never succeed in a white setting where there's not the opportunity for the kind of specialized attention that they need. That's number one. Even today on many college campuses, I find many black students who are from fairly good economic backgrounds, but they're not even happy or comfortable on the campus because there's no effort to really reach out to them. There's still this subtle kind of discrimination that goes on. Number two, it is very interesting that the black leaders in this country who led our struggle during the late 50s and the 60s the overwhelming majority of them have graduated from black colleges. And the reason I believe that they were so successful, although I don't have scientific proof, is due to the fact that by going to these black colleges, they had the opportunity for attention to be given to then professors, many of the minority professors saw their potential and helped to nurture it. You think of Richmond Young, Nedja Evers and uh, Martin Luther King, all of these men came out of black colleges. And it was because of the ability of coming from black institutions which helped to develop their poise and specific attention given to them. They were able to develop their personalities in such a way that they were not afraid to speak out or they were not afraid to give leaderships. They didn't have psychological and pathological kinds of problems that so often are found in situations where people do not take into consideration your specific needs. You fit in or you don't fit in. You come to a white institution for two years, you can't make it, you go. You know. 
hurting. There's no question about it. There's a brain drain. No question about it. We can't ignore that. That some of the most outstanding black students in this country today are in our white colleges and universities because of this question of access now and all of the different instrumentalities that have been utilized during the past few years to compel white institutions to take them in because a lot of white institutions weren't that interested in aggressive outreach educational casework. Fourthly, there's no question about it, and I've said this, and some black college presidents have become angry with me for saying it, but I don't push anything under the rug and hope it's going to disappear. I state issues clear. Black colleges, if they do not have the kinds of faculties, the kinds of science, science laboratories, the kinds of physical plants and the different things that are conducive to the learning out of an individual, they're not going to be able to hold on to students coming to their campuses. We have some beautiful black college campuses in this country. I've been on them gorgeous. There are others, in my humble opinion, with a few white ones that I've seen in Western Tennessee and Kentucky should close their doors. They don't have the rear with all that's necessary to have a first-rate kind of institution that will give the students, American students, whether they're black or white, the kind of education that they need. And of course, last but not least, if the alumni of black colleges do not turn their priorities around and support their institutions the way other groups support their institutions, a number of black colleges are going to have to close because they do not have a kind of situation where they can call upon funds or the dividends in the funds or interest or what have you to sustain them during prime periods. So black college alumni also have a certain responsibility in which they do not contribute to their colleges the way other groups do. And we have tremendous numbers of black persons that have graduated from black college and then earning very good money. But just as we ask this country to address itself to certain priorities, black folk need to address themselves to certain priorities in terms of helping the next generation that's coming along. Susan, you are an international lady of the planet. I am concerned with how do you use your time towards the future in the sense that you have a dream. Yours is an American dream that is worth flowering. And you've mentioned some aspects, like the thousand educators being sent on retreat. This has to be put together, but things like that can be tiny steps toward getting the kinds of changes within the educational realm of this country that will help it be what it is destined to be. Uh, other speakers have talked about context, that you have a sense of the context of education in the world. All students ought to have a sense of the context of the knowledge of any subject in the world that it exists in, and this is what education ought to be all about. To my mind, it is not giving it at any level in this country, and we are creating a vacuum inside human beings which is reflected in all the drug use at this campus, which is a partying campus. You come to this campus, man, to have a party for four years. And, oh, geez, they have to go to school? Like, there's a minority that is serious about the school, but they're a minority, and I'm probably describing many campuses. But this is just reflection of problem, and the problem is an internal one having to do with a lack of the liberal arts, a lack of the sense of tradition and context that humanity has come up through. And you see what I'm talking about. Oh, I do. I want to know how you are a person of power. How are you going to use your life in order to actuate things of your dreams, which will help us all? Thank you. The only thing that I can do, even though I'm out of the political arena, I'm still very involved 
behind the scenes in politics and in education. And uh, I have become a cutting edge. I'm not always welcomed in these meetings. The whispers take place as soon as they see me coming through the door. Some of them don't even come up and speak to me, but I'm not interested in whether they speak to me or not. The truth shall set all of us free. I am very serious about what I am about in America. And I will continue to provoke people's thinking, to work on a lot of these committees, to organize for certain things in this country. And that is the role that I intend to continue to play. Many gentlemen in Washington, they like me very much as a person because I think I have to say I'm pretty likable. I'm Bob anybody. I just do what I have to do. And they, I was in Washington the other day, and they were very surprised. They look at you. You aren't really getting older. You're so sprightly and what have you. And they thought they had gotten rid of me once I left the Potomac. Oh, no, they haven't gotten rid of me. I'm only functioning in other forums. I want to say to you, I'm not at liberty. I'm not at liberty to go into public detail about it. You will be surprised to see what is going to take place at the National Convention in 1988. And both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are going to lead in other kinds of directions with certain groups that are coming together in this nation. I'm going to be very much a part of that. They're not interested in holding on to tradition when tradition is no longer the answer to the problems we are grappling with in America. My trouble is, my humble opinion, is that there are too many persons who, in positions of authority in this country, do not have the morality of their consciences to do that which is right by people. It's a job. Uh, they function in terms of their salaries and the status and their network and what ha and then they couldn't care less. So people like me, that's why I said I could never be on any ticket. It's people like me that will have to continue to be shaker uppers, to rock the boat and be strong enough to withstand the insults, the laughter, the sniffering, the abuses that will come when you do these things. But whoever says that shrinking violates change in society. first question that you will answer that I want to ask here on the problems that students face in terms of the job market we have right now. Mm -hmm. Two ministers of education. Mm -hmm. That's only one part of the problem. And I'm not convinced. I, I'm an educator. I've yes, been yes, for 25 yes. years. Yes. I'm not convinced that that's the fundamental part of the problem. Eleanor Smale last night made a very short reference to what I think strikes more to the heart of the problem, which is anti-intellectualism in the United States. There's long, there's long tradition of this in the United States, and economic problems uh, simply feed it, foster it. In, in I, I wonder if you would comment on your perception of that problem, and uh, in, if you do, if you do find that there is an anti-intellectual uh, <coughs> preponderance of thought in the United States, particularly uh, uh, seeming to fuel some of the movements in the right in recent years, do you really hold out any hope for uh, for changing that fundamental? I'll give you what I see. I believe that in any society, first of all, you have to start out with the basic premise that change is always in the nature of things. And that the society has its ups and downs. If we go back and study the history of America, we will see that America has gone through different kinds of cycles. We've gone through cycles where uh, we were, we seemed to have, we were perceived as being very radical, too progressive, almost outlandish. And we're going through a cycle now where we seem to feel that everybody seems to be so conservatively, conservatively oriented and uh, there is a, uh, a lack of concern about certain groups in the society and the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor. We go through these cycles, it's all part of the cycles in, a, in, in any nation, not only in America. What I really think 
And I'm glad this is the last question. What I really think, it is not so much anti-intellectualism as much as it is that those persons who are the intellect, those persons who are the philosophers, the professors, uh, the scientists, and the learned citizen race in our nation, they seem unable or don't think it is important even in their classrooms or in their lectures or their counseling to students to make the connection between life and its real, raw, stark, naked form as we are living it and the different theories and doctrines that we're talking about, which comes from the theories, comes from our intellect. We are almost afraid to let people see how down to earth we are. Some of us seem, and I've watched this, some of us enjoy living in that ivory tower where we are almost untouchable. I've seen students afraid to approach philosophy professors and certain professors because they say, He's not with it. What do you mean he's not with it? What they really mean is a coolness, is an aloofness. There is no kind of humane warmth or compassion. They seem to enjoy being in this world by themselves. They come to the campuses and what have you, and they teach, and they conduct their research, and they give their individual students advice, but they never make an effort to go beyond that. It seems as though it's an isolated club. I, I don't really, oh, God help us if it's really anti-intellectualism. I don't think it's anti-intellectualism per se. I think it's a combination of factors that cause students to behave and act the way they do. Because after all, if I don't like you or you annoy me, I am not going to go the business trying to necessarily look like you or act like you. You can draw an analogy to the 60s. In the 60s, everybody was so concerned about the young people wearing sneakers, unwashed bodies, long hair. And everybody was talking about that. And they didn't want to talk with them. They didn't want to be seen with them. They were rebels. Get them off the camera. They didn't seem to understand that that kind of behavior was telling us something in America. And that's the behavior said, we don't want to be like you all. You all are out here. You all are not doing anything but bringing an end to the war in Vietnam. All you all these espousing your rhetoric and what. So we don't want to dress like you. We don't want to look like you. You were asking for help. And we didn't even seem to recognize what it was all about. Because we're so into ourselves. I really hope, sir, that the students of this country are not really. I don't think we're in an atmosphere of anti-intellectualism combination of a lack of warmth and fundamental basic human relationships in which even though we differ, we reach out to each other and share and explain and connect and interconnect. Many of us are too busy for it. Many of us are very class conscious. Many of us want to belong to our own little network, and I see it all the time. Good day. The Sisters of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority will make their presentation. Afterwards, Barbie Holtz will have closing remarks. And don't forget the reception for Ms. Chisholm at the University Museum at John Sutton Hall. I am the president of Theta Beta Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated here at IDT. I would like to present this award to our honorary member, Shirley Chisholm, for her outstanding achievements.
thank you very much. It's really for fun. I have uh, never had so many opportunities to be at a microphone without making an overt political statement in my life. So I'd like to say a little something, if I still have the strength. I usually like to work from a prepared text with all the intonations in it. Uh, I have two things that I'd like to do. One is to say a bit myself and to uh, thank the team. Let's begin with the idea that we have a little secret. Maybe it's not such a little secret anymore. We haven't really come here to talk about education. You know that. We've come here to talk about American democracy and about the future of America as a whole. Education is nothing more than a focal point for talking about our own future. So whether you come from the right, the center, or the left, I know some people are going to accept me, we're all speaking about the same issue. We have different perspectives, but I think the struggle now is a struggle based upon fear and a loss of individual and community control. And whether on the right or the center or the left, we begin to share that idea. Just, I'll be very brief. Debates such as this, again, are the essence of America. But I have a statement, I think, to make to the right, the center, and the left, each with a little bit of a different statement. To the right, some on the right, not all, I would argue that if the right is completely successful in making radical dialogue impossible, in making it impossible to talk about Marx and any set of beliefs, then what's going to happen is those individuals who make that impossible will probably never take power themselves and will have already traded away their right to dissent, and they won't like the world that they've created. To the left, and it's the same kind of point, if the left, many of them, are chilled out and say such things or imply, and let's take a quote that comes in a sense out of the 50s but will adapt it, I do not now read, nor have I ever read Marx, then the left is going to have nothing left to itself either, because it will have succumbed to its own limitations of freedom. And to the speaker a couple of days ago who said Marx is to be put in the history books, my argument would be very simply, just because we have Einstein's relativity, it doesn't mean that we can abandon Newton's law. They still apply, you still learn them in physics. They're a basis, but they must be treated critically as everything is treated critically. To those in the center, if the center keeps blowing with the wind, they're going to get blown away by a hurricane and there's going to be nothing left. Fear. We all fear. We fear on the right, we fear on the left. Let me just very briefly talk about a story that will be odd. And I'll, whether I am a Marxist or not, I'll call myself one just so people don't have a fear of saying that. I had a very interesting discussion last night. We finally were able to get together with a woman from the Eagle Forum. Now, obviously, politically, we do not stand in the same place. But we both have two children. We're both married. I've been married 15 years. Maybe she's been married 20 years. Our kids are similar. One is kind of wild and rowdy, and the other is really intelligent. We just reversed the order. She was in graduate school. I was in undergraduate school at the time. We talked. We established a personal basis for talking and then could begin to disagree about Nicaragua and begin to see we had different facts. We could begin to disagree about Vietnam but we linked up with each other as human beings. I'm not a utopian. I'm not simple-minded to think that you resolve all your problems by just talking to each other. But that's the basis. We all fear each other. The right is the enemy. They must be evil. They have this plan. The right says the same about the left. There may be some on each side. 
people have to communicate on the bases they can because if you don't listen to each other, you form that basis that we all share. We are all here. We have children. We want the best education for those children. And we need to begin to link up in those ways. And people have linked up here. The right and the left sat together at lunch, and the right spoke about vouchers, and the left said, well, I'm not sure I agree, but if you would do it, we might do it this way. They shared. The ideas are being shared. There is a change, I think, that will come about from that. And you should know that the left wing took all the legal forms, literature and the legal form took all the left wing's literature, you know. So we're all connected and all prepared. Uh, this symposium, I think, makes IUP unique because we have brought together these various political perspectives and begun a dialogue. This does not happen. We didn't teach teachers and other people how. How come you like to teach this guy there? How to go about their business, but how to think about America and how to think about education. And we have a great deal of academic freedom here at IUP, and we certainly have to thank John Welty for creating that atmosphere and for the faculty union helping to preserve it. Usually I say more and it's more intense, but I think I have to make the point of communication. Finally, I have to mention the symposium team. It's getting embarrassing. Everyone's saying, thank you, you did a great job. Well, if I did it alone, I wouldn't still be on this planet. And these are real people that have to be thanked. The meals and facilities, the continuing education, Barbara Endrick was an integral member of the team. The staff, staff hiring and other activities, Beth Nosek, who started as a student and who started typing for us, moved into a role of controlling all the vans and controlling the desks and making it happen. And I guess, actually, maybe we can give her uh, an internship for that. We'll have to check that out. Uh, press and publicity. Bill Swagger of the Media Relations Department, the cooperation we got was magnificent. He was an integral member of the team. It was fantastic the way we were able to work together. Housing and press coordination, Judy Michaels, and of the Sociology and Anthropology Department. I'll generally mention my own department when I can. She's an MA student who's now teaching with us. Um, Symposium coordinator for program. Jim Doherty spoke to all the speakers and other speakers and got them on the phone and began to set arrangements for them to come. And a couple of other people I want to mention. And I guess the order, I don't know what order to mention exactly people. It depends on what level we're operating, the abstract level or the concrete level. Erwin Marcus is our senior consultant. He's our only consultant, but he's also the senior consultant. It's the result of the four symposia that preceded this in the series that we have this one. And every time we sat back and went, oh, this is really going wrong. We're losing it, Irwin would say. Relax. Let's think about how to resolve it, and we would often have a resolution. And last, we should mention Rick Paduzzi on the very concrete level. If people were satisfied with the logistics, we should mention the Rick Paduzzi. And how can we best describe, and this was told to me by two people, Chester Finn, the Assistant Secretary of Education. This one's a little different, but I think this is what he said. Uh, said to Rick Paduzzi, I've never seen someone this efficient in my life. The federal government doesn't give us this many communications. He has held together the logistical sense of this whole symposium. And it's impressive in terms of how it was put together. So I had to thank the people. I was still very mild politically, right? And <laughs> thank you for all coming, and may your American dreams be happy ones. Take care. The vans are outside, and they'll take you where you got to go.